Right, we've done it. We've done it. Cute, cute little we've knock at the door. Hi. <laughs> oh, Robert, I think it's a different Robert. Greetings as well. We're actually in Berlin. Okay, yeah. awesome. So, Felix, you can see me and hear me. Deepak hey, can, can see me for sure. All ready to rock and roll. We are both there indeed. <laughs> Can't see me, but you can at least hear me. Is that correct? Okay, awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the problem with the um, video, but I think as long as we can hear, I'm just going to, whilst we jump into things, what I will do is, um, yeah, have a look, see if we can solve that. But I think as long as you can hear us, that's the most important thing. Rob, I'm just going to unmute you and then we can do some introductions before jumping into the content. Can we hear you? Yes. I, well, I can I hear myself. You got over the final hurdle. Excellent. <laughs> anyway, I know I knew something would go wrong, so all good. Um, awesome. So I'll give a quick introduction to sort of what we're going to cover today and um, just briefly go over the format. Um, welcome to anyone that's, everyone that's just joined. You've missed a couple of minutes of technical difficulties, but anyway, we're, we're over that, over the hill. Um, so I'll give you a quick intro to the format for today, then I'll give a quick introduction to myself, then I'll let Rob introduce himself, and yeah, and then we, then we go with it. So essentially what we um, you know, decided this week, Rob and I know each other quite well now, um, I thought it would just simply be a good idea to take some of the conversations we were having offline and share them with with other people um with you guys essentially anyone that works in product whether that's as a founder product manager designer somebody simply interested in in um innovation and, and product uh, technology whatever really so what i thought we could do today is start with um just sort of 10 15 minutes of questions that i will pose to rob and maybe we have a quick you know discussion on a few of these topics so I think we come at them from quite interesting um, areas of expertise, let's say, that complement each other quite well, but maybe offer actually quite different approaches to the question of innovation. And then what we will do is open up for questions for maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe less if nobody has any questions. Um, so action point, feel free to be posting any questions you have on the topic of innovation, remote work, product development, on the sidebar uh, where you can see the public chat. And what we will do is once uh, we finish these initial questions, these sort of intro questions, then we'll jump into those. Um, I'll just go from top to bottom and uh, yeah, see where we get with those, and how many we get through in this hour. So without further ado, let's jump into it. I'll give a quick introduction to myself. So hi, I am Henry. I am a CEO of Product Mastery. And what we really do is help product managers uh, or coach product managers to build great products and really advance themselves um, professionally. What we are currently trying to do is obviously provide some sort of support, give back in some way during the corona crisis. So um, what I'll offer at the end is simply, you know, if, if you have any questions on product development, on career advice, maybe you've lost your job recently and you're looking to find another one, then, then please feel free to reach out to me over email, LinkedIn, have a quick call. Uh, whatever you want, we're sort of here to to help. Uh, as I said, we'll, we'll leave some links at the end. So yeah, that's a quick intro to myself. Um, Rob, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, my name's Rob. Uh, I'm basically founder of Leap. And uh, Leap is a, a product design and innovation um, kind of, I guess, a, I don't want to say agency because it's not really an, even an agency yet, but basically um, just here to um, kind of service the world of innovation and do things um, in a slightly disruptive manner. So uh, my background, uh, ex-creative director for IBM Studios, uh, ex-product uh, um, uh, design manager for Qualcomm, and ex-product design director for AJN Smart. So kind of accumulating all of that experience that I've, uh, I've gathered in the last like 15, 20 years to kind of put to, to my own kind of use to, to help other people get started. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump into sort of what Leap does and what, and what, what you specialize in in a second. Um, cool. So, yeah, so let's I, I jump into a few questions for you, shall I? Let me sort of see where yeah. we Let's see where it goes. We can just, it's like, hopefully it'll end up like one of our conversations like we normally have trying to put yeah. the world to right. So. <laughs> let's see how it goes. 
The first one, I think it's really one that I think about a lot, um, and I'd be really interested to get your thoughts on this. What does innovation mean to you? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> innovation, yeah. I mean, it's actually, it's funny because um, it's kind of a word that I've tried to avoid using the last couple of years because it becomes like such a fucking buzzword of like, you know, oh, like innovation. And I think so many people have so many different interpretations of what innovation means. Yeah. Um, but I think from my perspective, innovation is really just, it's kind of doing something or being brave enough to try something and kind of put it into play um, that nobody else has really kind of dared to do. And obviously with innovation, as we know it, trying to do that before everybody else does it is, is actually the hardest part. So for me, it's just kind of daring to kind of go where nobody else has and you know, hopefully um, re you know, seeking and kind of reaping some rewards of being able to enable people um, in a way that they haven't actually realized before. So that for me is kind of innovation. Yeah, it's, it's something that I, um, I think also linked to that, that idea of, uh, you know, um, doing something new is, there's also though I think a pitfall, and I don't know if you disagree or agree with it, where something I see a lot of and find uh, quite funny is, Lots of companies try to sort of innovate for the sake of it. So it's like, you know, let's, let's say um, I saw a company that does sort of leadership coaching. It's like, let's build like an AI leadership coaching tool. And it sort of seems, you know, it's sort of like forcing a square into a circle sometimes where it feels a bit unnecessary. So I think there's that, yes, you want to be doing something new and, and obviously differentiate yourself as a business and as a product, but also sometimes it doesn't make sense to sort of re reinvent the wheel or try and be too clever about things in a way. Yeah. Would you say there's any... You know, I am. Maybe... Before you go into this, I want, I want to ask you the same question. What's your kind of perspective on what innovation is? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it ties into that, really. It's, it's, I think the emphasis for me is on... Let's take it back to really what... Why do companies innovate? To return to really sort of core first principles, I think innovation is in a business context an attempt to do something different in order to generate customers and ultimately make money from them. So, so let me give some examples to make that really, really clear. Um, so, for example, I don't think that if we're looking at like leadership coach or what we're doing at the moment, really working on um, coaching product people, right? Product managers, whatever. Um, we could, if we were to, let's say, go down the investment path, it would be easier to sort of pitch this like exciting vision of building this really clever AI tool that's gonna, you know, coach you every day, a couple of minutes per day, and it's gonna send you down this really new, unique, personalized path so we, we could do that and it would be innovative it would be new in this you know using new technologies and a whole new product type but on the other hand there is not a simple tool in this space of product coaching and mentorship right so there's courses and there is like learning on the job on the other side, sort of self-teaching let's say so for me it, it is also innovative to build a simple but effective product coaching tool, and as long as the positioning is unique. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, if it's focused on um, defining opportunities and like sort of validating them, and even getting to the point where you can generate revenue within, you know, let's say a couple of weeks of testing landing pages and, and basic product concepts, then for me that that is a unique offering, um, and that that is innovative even though we're not you know, using AI, we're not building a massive tech team. And I think specifically for product managers, uh, you know, our audience generally, I think we forget that really the core of our job is to create value for the customer and then for the business. Yeah. Uh, it's not about building the next sort of cool thing, the next big thing. Yeah, and actually almost providing a layer of like transparency and simplicity as well. And this is actually one of the things that I've kind of realized that a lot of the, the larger organizations that have wanted to kind of innovate in the last couple of years 
actually a lot of their um, their immediate gain can be from just simplifying their portfolio of products because um, there's just like this air of confusion when there, there are so many products that are very similar. It kind of tends to turn people off almost immediately. So, and it can be almost, I think with regards to like who we are and what we do with yeah. regards to kind of like the innovation space, actually providing like some of like, they can almost seem a bit too basic sometimes because we're, I was having this conversation the other day actually, it's like, because we are doing sprint after sprint or you know workshop after workshop, we yep. as kind of facilitators and product designers, we kind of continue to kind of like, oh, we want to like really kind of improve and like we really, really want to better ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we kind of going, oh, well, let's just make more, add more complexities to these products. These products need to do more. They need to do more than the current market products that are you know, offering out there. Mm -hmm. And that in turn, just means that like you're kind of almost forgetting some of the more basile kind of like offerings that actually can provide you know these users that maybe aren't so tech savvy just a really like um, you know a, a really easy kind of point of entry so yeah I think that shouldn't really be taken for granted as well so if you're doing sprints or doing innovation yeah just think, sorry good yeah just like think about how actually just really simplifying something can also bring you huge gains as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, also, I also think one, one thing that, I mean, it's a human, human nature, we sort of jump on solutions rather than problems. And, you know, I'll come on to actually the next question will be about the design sprints, but what, what you guys do. But um, I think also we forget that it's better to not need code and not need like big complex teams and big complex products. So if you can solve the problem with a simple landing page and like, you know, one-on-one -on -one call or whatever, yeah. that, then that is, uh, you know, in terms of, Again, going back to first principles about delivering value for the business, like generally that can actually be a more effective approach to it. And as you said, sort of stripping things down yeah. generally, you know, think of web conversion. If you strip down a web page, take away all of the, you know, link to the blog and whatever, you know, whatever they have about section, et cetera, et cetera. Generally, you're going to see a reduction in conversion. Yeah. But um, mentioned, sorry, you mentioned the sprint process and workshop. Just talk us through, because I know there'll be some people that are new to this. Talk us through um, firstly what a design sprint is in in a you know nutshell, and why you think it's so powerful um, for helping companies innovate. Yeah. So in a nutshell, um, the sprint uh, process um, enables companies to really move forward with a vision um, or an idea of what a product can be um, in a matter of days rather than months. And, you know, coming from, you know, companies where, you know, I, I've worked on products for a year or 18 months uh, or yeah. even three months. Um, and I've also helped kind of, um, you know, these companies kind of realize their vision, but like they don't really get the data from how that's kind of performing way down the line or even after it's been kind of launched on the App Store. So really the sprint enables you to understand whether it's not about, you know, this sounds like such a cliche as well, but it's not just about designing a product. It's actually about designing the right product. So you'd yeah. rather know that you're designing the right product for the right type of audience in a matter of days rather than months or even years. So it sounds kind of like a cliche, but, you know, or like if you're not familiar with it, or you've heard this, um, this kind of buzzword of sprint so often, you're kind of thinking, ah, oh, it's just not possible. It is possible, and I I actually made uh, like my first um, product, um, my first app on the App Store in 2009. I was mm -hmm. with a, it was actually not my concept, it was somebody else's, and they kind of brought me in as the UX and visual designer. But we kind of shared the burden of getting this app to the App Store between us. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is, I wish I'd known Sprint in 2009 because yeah. we literally built the whole product and we could have worked out much yeah. more quickly uh, which components were really relevant to those users and actually got something to the app store like much, much quicker. So yeah. it's really powerful. Uh, I also come from a design thinking background as well. So I'm a very uh, big advocate of design thinking. And at the moment, um, I, the sprints that I'm offering are actually having this kind of combination of like pulling more of design thinking components into the design mm -hmm. sprint. Because, you know, as all processes, they can be molded and applied to kind of whatever you want. And um, this, for me, there's still, you know, it still feels like, a, you know, a pudding that's not quite cooked properly. You know, there's things that can be enhanced. Um, so um, this is kind of what I'm working on now is kind of like to kind of get the best kind of recipe so that something can be cooked completely how, how, how I want it. 
So um, yeah, I think for those companies that are kind of really unfamiliar with this process, it, for you it enables you to uh, to fail fast, fail quickly, or actually not, but to actually kind of really understand the market and really understand the product that you want to get to, the, to your people. And it just means that you don't end, uh, you don't waste endless amounts of budget or people's resources or time into kind of getting something to market that's actually the right fit. So yeah. it's really, that's answer. I mean, really interesting as well, because like, you, again, we've come at this from like very different but similar routes, because like, I started my first business in 2008, no, no, later, sorry, 2012. But uh, like put all of my savings into this, like outsourced a prototype, thought it was gonna be the best thing ever. Yeah. Got like a big bunch, you know, a big um, wave of downloads initially, got really excited about that, you know, ego blown out of proportion, et cetera, thinking I'm the next Steve Jobs, and then very quickly realized that we just weren't really solving a problem. So yeah, shut that business down after about a year and a half trying to work out really what to do. Yeah. On my side I have this like very, very you know, pain point around or obsession with following a lean process. Like whenever we're doing anything, like validate, validate, validate. And I think now that I've coming back to the topic of innovation, like now that we are, um, um, sorry, now that I've discovered the design sprint myself, uh, we ran our first lightning decision jam, for example, on, on Monday. So using the framework there, I found it's a really nice tool to, um, you know, part of a let's say a product manager toolkit really to to as, as you say sort of get people in a room and quickly move from product to solution whereas i think if you follow the traditional like lean startup approach it's much more it's slightly more waterfall and it's in that you don't have this sort of effective way to ideate and move towards a solution it's yeah. more maybe the ceo uh, in a small company or the head of product or product manager it's going to come up with the initial idea and you know, just sort of get buy-in, I found, from, let's say, developer or designer, whereas actually I think the sprint we found, at least on Monday, it's a really nice way to get objectively everyone's opinion and not let any one person sort of override things. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's let's move on to public questions because, I mean, I can scatter a few in, but so broadly speaking, I think, um, our, sorry, the questions that we've covered so far is that when it comes to innovation, we can summarise that, you need in some way, whether you're using a design script, or whether you are using the startup approach, or for example, we use something called the product character, you need obviously a way to quickly move from um, problem to solution. I think in both of our cases, we, we believe that design sprint is a really effective way to, to do that. Um, and we can, we'll send out some resources at the end of it uh, for anyone that wants to sort of learn more about that process, or if you want to reach out to either of us, best to speak to Rob about the design sprint, however. Um, so that sort of sets the foundation, I suppose, for, for the conversation. Let's then move on to specific questions. So I'm going to take questions from the top. So um, Deepak, I've been tasked with building greenfield products. What do you mean by greenfield products? Like new, innovative? How do I get started? What are the frameworks for innovation you've used? What are books on innovation to read? So I think there's, um, I think for me there are two parts of this, and Rob, maybe you help out on this question. So for me, it's it, the most effective approach that I've found to kick off innovation is, is the design sprint, either the full four day, or, for example, just the lightning decision jammer, it's a one hour workshop. And not, you know, not too difficult to, to set that up. And I think the real challenge, though, is what comes next. So, and when we talk about frameworks, um, at least, you know, from my experience, the most, if you're only going to read one thing, reading the book Hacking Growth would be <laughs> my recommendation. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> I've got four books here, right, on my to my right, specifically because I knew that this question was going to pop up. Uh, right, right. Um, maybe you jump in. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. So, um, actually, I, I think I think one really important point, particularly from you know my perspective as a product manager, is we you don't need super complex frameworks for this. Broadly speaking, you need some way of saying um, switching your mentality from task like we're building this feature we're doing this task to what are we trying to learn yeah what is our hypothesis and 
hacking growth, or again, product capture is a framework I use that I'll, I'll share with you guys after, simply is saying, okay, what do we need to learn? Uh, what do we believe will happen? And how are we defining success? You don't need, you know, it's not rocket science. You don't need to follow strict sprints for that. You can just do a simple Kanban board, probably even better do a simple Kanban board. Uh, as long as you're focused on the outcome of what you're working on, then you're going to be moving in the right direction. I think hacking growth gives you a really nice, you know, why behind you need to think like this, and, and secondly, a, a sort of simple framework to apply. Any thoughts on on your side, Rob? On that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the kind of the greenfields thing for me was quite an interesting part because I think specifically within enterprise uh, kind of initiatives for innovation, this is something that I've obviously had some experience yeah. with. And it's just kind of just you're just putting uh, you're you're within the space where you necessarily don't necessarily have uh, like competitors or you're you don't necessarily have too many restrictions. So um, that's kind of my experience of kind of like the greenfield approach. But um, so so coming again from design thinking and the design sprint, yeah, like I mean, if you have quite if all of you that are watching have specific questions about uh, the four or five day, I can go into that more like offline. I don't think it's kind of completely needed for now. Um, but it's just about kind of getting started and kind of changing the mindset for um, for for how these large com like companies and organizations actually want to start um, like changing the way that they work. So with regards to IBM and IBM design thinking or IBM enterprise design thinking that it is now, that's a really great start because uh, I'm having a lot of conversations still um, with IBM and other um, large organizations about how uh, they can really um, like light the spark for like uh, giving people the space to be um, innovative and even it comes down to you know like don't have like a dedicated innovation space because of that really ostracizes kind of like other employees basically every employee has the capacity to be innovative and no, kind of like point. yeah and to, to kind of come up with ideas so, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to kind of, I'm just reading the question again because I want to make sure I really answer it for Deepak. So I've been tasked with building Greenfields products. How do I get started? Okay, so to answer that question, you, you need to really just, I think the sprint is actually a really good way for you to get started because you can, you can get really good results really, really quickly. And like Henry said earlier, um, the LDJ um, is a really, really good exercise because it's almost like, um, this is almost like an entry kind of point to anyone who has never done a design sprint before. Um, obviously, you know, this this comes out of AJ and Smart, and they used to use this a lot for uh, kind of going into companies to kind of show them kind of like how the kind of core principles of design um, of a design sprint works, you know, with the, the post-it, the note and vote, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you can really understand um, kind of very quickly challenges uh, that, the, that the company is having very, very quickly. And then that in turn enables you to really understand like which process you want to like bolt onto kind of like solving for that. It could be design thinking, it could be you know some digital transformation initiative, it could be design sprint, it could be anything. Like they're all valid uh, kind of processes that can help uh, any number of situations. So I think that would be a very good way to get started. So in a nutshell, go in with like an LDJ, run a quick like one hour workshop, find out what the challenge is. You can keep it quite broad at this point. My advice to you would be go go to leadership first. Don't go to kind of like the, you'll have more impact by going the, the more senior kind of route because you'll then be able to kind of understand more um, along the lines of what the kind of biggest challenges that company or that division is having right now. And you know, you can pull in a couple of people um, like consultants or designers or product managers to then kind of help you kind of action uh, kind of the results from that meeting. And the, the kind of the advice I want to give here is that at the end of an LDJ, you should have something that's actionable within two weeks. And this is where people can really kind of see that you're not only committed to just going in and running like a facilitation or like a leadership workshop, but you're also really keen to kind of like keep that momentum going. And um, the LDJ is a really good example. So you can kind of keep them posted then and kind of keep them up to date. And I think you'll get buy-in really quickly with regards to, okay, let's just try a sprint. And it just might mean that you run, you know, maybe like your own version of a sprint just to get that traction. 
but that's still a really good way to kind of make an inroad. So I don't want to consume all the time, but this is a really good question. We could have probably just had like this one question alone as a kind of theme for this kind of conversation. But again, like talk to Henry, talk to myself afterwards. Um, we're happy to kind of follow up. If there's anything that you didn't feel you know, they got fully answered and you want more insights from, then we're happy to share that, obviously, so. And we're also gonna be running, um, Rob, you're welcome to join us next. Tuesday, we'll be running a live Lightning Decision Jam. Cool. Uh, with the Product Mastery team. So uh, just to sort of show people how it works. Yeah, cool. Uh, and to practice it ourselves. But um, yeah, we'll, Deepak, we'll share a link actually. But I, th I think that's a really, really good point with, I mean, it's like with, ev think of any, any change of behavior you have to start very small. So I think coming in and, you know, even the word digital transformation is, it, it's, you know, it's like saying it, it's too big a change, I think, too quickly. So it's like, say, for example, you want to start losing weight. You don't go to the gym for four hours a day. You start with something very small and not so intimidating, like walking around the block, for example, yeah. uh, once a day or doing 100 steps, whatever it is. And I think the lightning decision jam, as I see it, but Rob is the right person to speak to on this. It's sort of a Trojan horse, sort of a little small commitment you're getting people to, sorry, it's a small thing for people to commit to because, you know, what's an hour? Yeah. Um, it's also um, a lot of fun as well. And you'll find that, and this, is, this also touches on a point that you mentioned earlier, because the sprint is a very democratized process. Mm -hmm. And it just means that the LDJ kind of really shows you the insights to that as well, because it means that, you know, if you're running uh, an LDJ in a corporation or a workplace where you already work and it's a very large organization and you want to make a lot of changes, um, this is a really good way because it just means that like, okay, so the most senior person in there has, a, has the voice and obviously they have the voice to kind of veto like the kind of direction that you want to go down. But yeah. what it also means is that when you're doing, for example, like the note and vote, people are, everybody has a voice. Everybody has like this even voice. It's not like, you know, you're a sales guy and you can just wind people down to kind of death just by just boring them and shouting out the most loudest things. You know, and something that I always say in a sprint is that, you know, quite often the quietest ones have the, the most valuable contributions. And it just means that it just, it's an equilibrium for everybody to volunteer their ideas. And, you know, it's a really great way for also people just to have that voice that maybe, you know, they would normally be a little bit too kind of scared to kind of, say if something really feels like it's not working or you know there's changes that can be made they can do that kind of anonymously so yeah it's really really powerful yeah i think that's a you know, really good point as well as you otherwise you, you only see ideas from strong personalities yeah exactly yeah. yeah exactly but the fun is trying to guess the hand work handwriting at some point so yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, let's jump to the next question by robert because it ties in very very well with what we've just talked about. Um, so, I mean, as, as Rob suggests, you know, but really experienced in this space, best way is really starting with something small like a light decision jam, ideally then moving towards a sprint to, to you know, really get momentum behind an idea and get alignment and commitment. Um, but as Robert said, um, you know, this is a really big question, something we talked about last week, right, is you know, how do you encourage an enterprise to try innovation or tactics such as design sprints to be disruptive and most importantly not give up at the first hurdle so we talked about right that running design sprint great but how do you keep up that that um that culture of innovation like put the you know problem solving rather than just creating a big backlog that doesn't make sense yeah i mean this is also a really large topic because uh, i've been fortunate that the companies that i've run design sprints for the typically the mm -hmm. decider or the person that's coordinating the initiation of a design sprint is like fully on board already so there's been less uh, kind of um, of a conversation needed to persuade them but I still had these conversations like outside of work um, even with friends and colleagues that work within you know different industries and it's it is a really like it is a tough ask to kind of get them to kind of take that leap if they've never made a decision to do a, a design sprint before mm -hmm. and I think a lot of the time is that a, a lot of these companies they just don't actually realize it's possible to do uh, the output in the time. Um, I think a lot of these companies also realize that it could 
heavily. So you know, you're kind of setting this ripple uh, motion going through the company that you know the output of a design sprint is accelerated, it's intense, it's stressful, and you can't sustain it for you know like months or weeks afterwards. That's why it's designed to be like a four like a four week process. The one that I offer. They're really, really, you know, they, I mean, this is a topic that I'd spend a lot of time thinking about because it's really where I think where we place ourselves, let's say, in, in, you know, where we can offer value to people. And I think, I mean, a really important point is that you can't just be doing design sprints all the time, right? No. You, need, um, you need a clear sort of vision and that initial prototype from the design sprint. But actually, you, yeah, in some ways, you should even be moving faster after that because. You know, say for example, you you are testing landing pages. You sh- ideally, you should have a small cross-functional team that's really running a test even every day, every couple of days or so. Yeah. So I think the challenge is transitioning from this sort of workshop framework to more of a you know what it, what's that ongoing cadence like? like what, how do we how do we have our planning meetings? Uh, when are we reviewing results of experiments? Who are responsible for these things? And I think the big challenge, well, I think the advantage of a design sprint is that in a non-cross-functional team, yeah. so traditionally, right, companies are broken or siloed by development, product, marketing, sales, all split up, all nicely in boxes. That doesn't make sense, but anyway, we won't get that today. Um, <laughs> the cool thing, the potential that I really see with design sprint is that for those companies, you're actually putting these, you're creating a cross-functional team, right? You're getting leadership, product management, sales, marketing, design, whatever, in a room aligned around a common goal. So for me, it seems, you know, maybe you've got some examples of, it seems like the natural step that they would stay together and and move towards, um, you know, not just validating the prototype, but actually delivering a product that that ultimately generates value for the customer and generates revenue for the business. Yeah. have you seen, you know, what are, what may be a common theme that you've seen with teams that have sex- successfully moved from design sprint to, to you know, keeping that cadence, that, that cadence of innovation? Do you know what? The interesting thing is, so, like, oh, I mean, Henry, you know my background is design. Um, and for me, when I first embarked upon the design sprint, I, I wasn't really even sure I even agreed with it. Yeah. Um, and, um, but for me, like, even as a designer, uh, like a product designer, the takeaway for me from running all these sprints with all these companies is it, it actually the prototype is is a small component of the output. The biggest kind of what I call like goosebump moment for these client uh, for these clients and these corporations is actually the alignment. And I think this kind of goes back to that question about you know how can you persuade companies to kind of like try a sprint. And I, for me, the conversations where I've kind of had the, the kind of the trigger moment where you can you see the penny drop with a person it's like when you explain to them that the alignment that you get by lunchtime on a Monday is, yeah. is um, basically equates to like several months of not doing something, you, they find it hard to believe that you've achieved that in such a short space of time. But for me, like the, the biggest output is having that team aligned on their forward vision and the way that they're thinking. So for me, like that's kind of one of the components where I would say this is the moment where people realize that there's value in it's not just a sprint for a you know a prototype and getting, getting data, it's actually for aligning teams as well. And I think they have very little to lose for trying something in such a short space of time, and that's typically what triggers people to try it. Yeah, uh, that's great. That's such a good point because I mean we we um, you know during the sort of beta phase. Of- product mastery which we're, we're still really in but, but when we're sort of initially validating the concept yeah we're really t- you know talks to like a 100 different product managers and it's a very common problem is you know there i mean most common questions are things like how do i prioritize effectively how do i run outcome orientated development i.e you know we set the goal as a team and we work out how to move towards that with my individual product team i think a very very common theme was that well or point that I made is what well, you can't prioritize if there's no framework in place yeah usually that is because whoever that person's boss is whether it's a CEO CPO or head of uh, okay. you know product line yeah is not clear on it themselves <laughs> like they're not really sure what they're trying to achieve so so product managers when are not getting a clear you know here is the objective we're pursuing such as you know we would like to increase retention by 20 percent 
over the next three months, let's say, or acquisition, whatever it is. And because they're not given this scope, you know, of what we should be doing and what we should not be doing, um, it's, yeah, really hard for them to really to make anything happen. So, and I think uh, exactly as you said, there's a huge amount of value in simply getting your boss in the room to commit to a direction that, that you that you are going to move in as a team. There's a lot more freedom to work. Once you're all clear on the objective, then there's like kind of how you how you move towards that objective, how you how you achieve the objective. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, but it's I mean it's a yeah I think it's a really tricky one. I think again it's this case of of how do you start small? So coming out of the design, design sprint, trying to keep that team together, whether that's full time or you know committing one day a week or twenty percent of your time, and if you can quickly deliver value, which you could even do in the design sprint, quickly show you know hey this is working. Look how many users are interested, or look how many users are using the first version. Then it starts to snowball because I think if you're following an effective process, you will build a better product than the other teams in your company or other product teams sort of on the market. Um, awesome. Next one by Frank. Um, this is an interesting one. So sorry, Frank, just to clarify. So visited Rob one year ago with the university. Great experience. Thank you, Rob. I made a prototype which I want to validate with specific organizations. With everyone working at home, I'm having trouble reaching them. Do you guys have any tips? Interesting. Um, I actually would like to kind of throw that question back to Frank because I'd like to know like yeah, why that's happening. Because typically, um, whenever I, I would say probably ninety five percent of user interviews that I've done in the last two and a half years have been like online through uh, like Zoom or whereby or whatever. So it could be for me that maybe you're just not in contact with the right people um, because there should be no excuse as to why people can't kind of review something uh, if you send them a link e either via Marvel, for example, so, or like Figma, you can guide them through uh, like a web browser and they will be able to give you feedback. So yeah. I would say that if you are having trouble, uh, maybe it's because you're getting blocked because the person is either like slightly freaked out by it because they don't really know what's expected from them. And uh, so I would just make sure that you have very clear explanations about what your expectation is. And um, you know, I know it's probably going to be different because you're you're probably making a prototype and you don't have budget to offer like vouchers for for their time. So I would suggest that you just make sure that you have a very clear explanation about why you're contacting them. Um, or if they could even recommend people, if they can't actually take the time to do it, then they could recommend people uh, within the organization that would maybe take time to go through it. So I think there's a bit more of a back end to this question. I'd like to know a bit more about it because I just want to make sure that my answer is a very generalized answer. So um, yeah, happy to kind of help you further on that one as well. It, sorry, for me, it was, that was a really interesting question as well because it, um, I think it reveals something that is really, I think it, the most important thing about building product that is not taught and not, not thought about enough, which is really actually what is your, what is the offer you're making? So I think broadly speaking, right, when we're building products, everything is about offering some sort of transformation to someone. So if we are, you know, um, offering weight loss. We, we want to show how somebody, you know, overweight, unhappy person turns into good looking, great body, smiling face thing. Yeah. If we are building, um, you know, let's say in our case, right, we're building a tool to sort of really help you become a product expert. The wording is very, very important. And even when we're reaching out to people to, to you know, get them to test a prototype, we need to put it in their terms and sell them the transformation that they are looking for. So if, for you know, in our case, for example, we if we're reaching out to somebody, say, hey, you know, do you want to check out our product or do you, um, you know, you're available for, for a quick conversation? Everything we say will always have something like, you know, we help you become a product expert with just five minutes a week. This kind of message. And if you can crack that message, right, that offer, that sits in between where they currently are, you know, unhappy person that, that's, you know, not fulfilling their goals, 
and where they want to be their desired outcome. If you can sort of position yourself in the middle and say, like, hey, hey guys, like we're the vehicle that's going to help you get there. Um, and even though this may be a university project, for example, like if you can get really good at that, which is considered a marketing skill, but really it's it's core product skill. If you can get good at that, um, and you'll see very quickly, you know, if you reach out to these organizations with a good message that resonates with them, that helps them achieve whatever desired outcome they're looking for, then everything else is really easy. You know, you're going to get uh, eight out of 10 responses rather than one out of 10. Um, and, and again, it's such a small thing. Like it's not about building this big complex product or prototype or even needing to do a design sprint initially. It's just simply, what is that, that sentence we are, we are pitching to people? Um, so I found that a really, really interesting question because it's again, it's something that we we think about like the solution, the prototype, and not just the message and the promise we are making to people. Yeah, no, it's a really nice, really nice um, like uh, like perspective that you brought to that question as well. But I think again, that probably ties in with me working more in the sort of very lean, more early stage, right? So constantly just putting stuff in front of people and seeing what comes back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, probably another question for you here from Evan. So in a world of digital or in a digital world, is the sprint model really transferable to other industries like physical products or just useful for sort of work fast, iterate and ship um, kind of well, digital, let's say. Yeah, really good question, actually. Uh, really no, I'm good. not right past start, so Rob, do you want to jump in? <laughs> really good question. And um a special hello to Evan as well. So I know Evan. So um, yeah, thanks for joining today, dude. Um, so actually, it's a really good question, and this is something that will just bubble up so many times as well because I think you know we are constantly asked about. Okay, um, you know I have a digital challenge. Then obviously the design sprint like fits perfectly with that. That's totally fine. I do know of examples where the world of the physical um, has been um, an output of a sprint, but they're just kind of like, they're fewer. And it, they're less kind of, it's so weird. I was having a conversation today just about this. And um, I've had many conversations. I had a guy um, who made uh, prosthetic limbs, like he was wanting to know whether a design sprint would help him. And the, no. yeah, wow, actually you say that, but. It can, but you have to be very, um, very clever about what you kind of commit to or what you can, um, what you offer. And for example, it could just be that like, okay, let's take the, the prosthetic limb guy. I mean, it would be a very challenging sprint for sure, but it might just be that the output of a sprint could be um, that it's more like a sales deck or a, uh, a new product that's coming out. And obviously, yeah. you're not going to make that product. And this is one of the really cool things about one of the many conversations I've had with Jake, because this bugged me so much. I never wanted to kind of feel like I couldn't hey, offer Jake, something. Jake, yeah. Jake, Jake and Abdi. This is one of the other four books. So if anyone is on this call who has not read this book, this is your <laughs> next buy from Amazon, OK? Because this also, Jake, he's Amazon. such a fucking humble guy. Like, he's a really, really cool guy. Um, so. Whenever I got like vexed with a, a challenge or a question, I would at any opportunity I would um, try and talk to Jake and kind of like just pick the kind of the the master's brains about kind of like what you know how he would kind of solve for it. And he basically just said that you know this comes down to the prototype that you don't actually make the product; you are making the illusion of that product. You want to know how that product is likely to perform in the market. So this is. Um, has anyone ever heard of the phrase prototyping? This is kind of a, the similar thing. Um, the prototyping. prototyping, yeah. This is like uh, when you kind of you're just creating the illusion of that product, or maybe yeah. you are dressing up a product that already exists, but just rebranding it just to see how it how it performs within the market. And um, he basically was just saying, yeah, like you know, so there's uh, examples where you know, he, uh, the, the physical output of a sprint would be that they wanted to re, um, redesign uh, like the doctor's showroom so it was more child friendly. Or um, there's a really good one with AJ and Smart where they had to share the meal bar. So they were making actual bars with nuts and honey to kind of prove whether people would want to buy this physical bar. Um, there's other things as well, like with regards to um, another example that Jake offers, which is the um, 
the Savvy Oaks uh, hotel thing where, you know, if you've forgotten your, your toothbrush, this little robot will come and deliver you your, your right. item that you've forgotten. And so it is possible. You just have to think very carefully about, you know, what it is that the challenge is actually solving and um, how you're going to kind of go about that. And one of the things that as well, like as in like when you first do a sprint, you will have um, like crazy, crazily like over ambitious kind of solutions that you want to put into play. And something that I've learned from the years that I've been doing sprint is that it doesn't matter actually that you have these really wacky ideas. You can always you can always kind of smoke and mirror as the prototype to kind of convey that. So you know, and I remember there was a, in the early days there would be like, Woo, you know, like you've got to try and mop that up. And it's like, but you know, there's easy ways of doing it. Like this, just you don't have to build the actual product. So um, it's a really interesting one, and Evan, like I'm, you, I know we're, you know, we have conversations quite infrequently throughout the year, but it's good to see you on here. I, I, there's probably something that's specifically playing on your mind, which is what you want to test. So I would be very keen to kind of know what that is, and um, yeah, if this is a, a again another bigger conversation, then um, I would very much welcome you to get in touch. Sorry, that, sorry to interrupt. There's, and there's also a really, really important lesson that that within that point and i think it is that we i think we almost always step back from what we perceive to be risk so for example like we don't feel comfortable testing something because it's not perfect or it's you know it's, it's simply not the product that we're you know let's say we have a landing page we don't actually have the product something within us if we are moral people feels uncomfortable with that but i think that we, you know, it's really important to get over that because in, you know, maybe in this case, you set yourself back a year, two years developing the physical product only to find out after that, um, you know, you can't sell it maybe. And I think realizing the gravity of the situation that, you know, if you're starting your own business or building a product that, you know, that one big failure can set you back and, and even sort of, you know, put you off entrepreneurship unnecessarily. Um, I think should always be this, you know, reminder there. And so I think a lesson for everyone is, and I try and remember this myself, is how can we test something now and not push back and not, you know, go and code something, go develop something before. So being a bit more ruthless with ourselves, a bit more urgent, I think is, is a good yeah. skill. To have. Yeah, that's really valid, really valid. You have such a, like, Henry, you have such a, like, calmness to your kind of, like, your, and like, it's fucking cool. Books, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, um, I, I, I don't think I mentioned this to you, but I published a book last year called Why Your Startup Is Failing. I mean, essentially, my the core lesson from my journey in entrepreneurship over the last sort of eight, nine years is that it's not, um, you know, and again, talking about process, it's not always the frameworks or the processes or years of experience. I think if you are able to be someone that's very like, analytical and calm and then being able to sort of observe your thoughts and actions more effectively, then that is really the foundation for all success. Yeah. Because again, as we start, you know, we create these false beliefs around like, oh my God, we have to build this thing and it's going to take two years to do. And then only then we find out that it's not valid. I think there's sort of, taking a little step back at times and saying, okay, like, why do I believe that we can't do this? Or, you know, can we find an easier way to flip the problem or flip the solution? And these types of, if you're able to ask these questions of yourself, then you, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a 16 year old first time entrepreneur or a, you know, 50 year old with, with 40, 30 years experience, whatever in the industry, I think it's a massive competitive advantage to in an era where people are really stressed and over busy and underslept, that a lot of people actually skip over. Yeah, and you're right, there are more components than because I've seen some amazing products be made and built and deployed, but right. I've also seen some really amazing products just not get the traction needed to kind of continue. And well, exactly. to, and also, I mean, one yeah. thing that, that I have a big problem with the, you know, where I have a, a, a qualm with the whole lean startup and, and even the design sprint is in a lot of cases, you can be building something that ultimately cannot generate revenue. So, I mean, you know, my, uh, an example from our side, like last year we launched a journaling app and, and we had good traction, like a hundred downloads a, a day or so, like some revenue from it. Yeah. But ultimately, um, you know, all of the feedback showed that we weren't at least, 
where we left it, we weren't able to generate revenue. And we sort of said, we think there are easier markets to go into. So we sort of took the team, reset and said, okay, what would we do if today is day one? But, um, you know, we would have saved nine months if we had really optimized for revenue early. And that's really, you know, one of the reasons actually, I think one of the things we've done well with product mastery is we're still already sort of three months into things, but by simply selling a course on our website, um, you know, over the last couple of months, we've been able to at least say, there's something here that people are willing to pay for. So we can now sort of pursue that in a more um, long-term way. So we sort of gone from rather than just validating, do people like this? It's do people like this enough to actually pay for it? <laughs> Which is a really, really important question. And obviously more so when you're a small, you know, like we're a three person team, it's a really, I'm bootstrapped. Um, so that, that is essential for us. Whereas I think you can get away with it more if you're, an intrapreneur, right? You're within a bigger company. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was a long detour. My fault there. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Let's cover. So we've got about eight minutes left. Let's cover um, Gray Nilio's point. That's just been sorry. The question's just been asked, and then Frank, I'll try and get back to your point uh, before we wrap things up. So. What are your opinions on combining art and technology to develop new innovations? How do you think the combination of these two would go in the current tech industry? Um, what are you defining art there, Rob? I think you're coming from design thinking. Maybe you're the best. Yeah, yeah I can. I mean, know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would like to know more about this because I think is it art in the fact that now, like because as in the art world because or I is it more like a creative and digital because there's two ways you can really answer well there's two ways that I could answer that question and the first one I asked is because obviously with the world as we know it now if it's an art kind of question art is heavily reliant on the presence of people within that space I just don't know if that's the right angle to go down if it's a creative question then this is a question that I can really answer with experience because my background is uh, as a design and an artist. Um, it's the perfect combination. So like if you are able to put yourself in an environment where you can um, express, even if it's just expressing your ideas, like actually Henry and I were just talking now just before we joined the call about sketching and you know being able to express your ideas and if you are a, a creative person you obviously you have a slight advantage um, there's another reason why um, you know you the sprint is good because you don't need to be a creative to kind of get your ideas out so there's a nice kind of side to that um, can you read the question again Henry I just don't want to go off track on this one because I can't actually see it in the list on this one. So what are your opinions on combining art and technology to develop new innovations how far do you think the combination of these two would go in the current tech industry? Yeah. I, well, yeah there's two parts in there. About the, one is sort of applying what I, I would consider design thinking, which is your area of expertise. And then I mean, in terms of market opportunity, it really depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. I, I mean, I see this as something that's just all, that I've always done anyway. So um as a kind of a creative person then um there is a great i mean yeah it's just like of course there's a there's a space for it and a place for it and you know the the two to mix are are in a the the, the time now that we have the, the the kind of the technology era that we're facing this is the best it's ever been to kind of combine the two together and um yeah, I, 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 maybe I'm struggling to answer this question because it's just something that I do naturally anyway. So maybe Henry, I'm going to go back to you, and then maybe you might trigger I, something. I, I think the core of that, the underlying issue that I sort of see with the question is, you're looking at applying specific solutions. So imagine you have an idea. I'm sorry, this is complete something, so I don't have enough context. But if you have a pre, you know, an idea of what you want to build you're already jumping to the solution rather than the problem, um, which means there's a danger of building something that nobody wants. If, however, you know, for example, you're interested in that space, I would suggest having 10 conversations with artists in a really specific area, so maybe like graphic designers or, I don't know, pastel 
color, you know, I don't know, oil painters, for example, whatever, really specific niche and go, hey guys, like, you know, what challenges are you facing? Um, if you get, you know, they say, uh, you know, I don't know where to buy my tools nowadays. Uh, you go, oh great, what have you tried to solve that? And you, so you're quickly moving from understanding what is the core problem they're facing. Have they taken action to solve it? Because if they haven't, it's probably not a big problem. And with those two insights, you can then start moving towards a solution. So you go, you know, okay, you've got this oil painter says he doesn't know where to buy quality um, painting kit. And he's tried everywhere and he's spent loads of money on like 10 different products, not happy with any of them. Insight for you is then, okay, well, how about I run a design sprint? Or if you're by yourself, simply put up a landing page offering high quality oil painting, whatever, equipment. Send it back to them, say, hey, guys, are you interested? Or even get them to commit to buying something, yeah. even under product. That's how I would flip it. So really understand who's the audience, what problem are they trying to solve? Is it a big enough problem that they are willing to act and ultimately pay for it? Yeah. Uh, Maybe that helps. But yeah, yeah, because I think actually um, you've kind of triggered on the empathy side of things, haven't you? Because you're you're going at it from a design thinking kind of approach, where like you want you are encouraging um, you know to go to users first, to kind of all the customers first, and trying to find out where their um, where their pain points are, and then yeah. this is where you can kind of creatively kind of intertwine and understand from someone with technology uh, as a like a product designer, for example. Then you can kind of translate those um, those pain points into exactly. opportunities. Yeah, exa exactly. I think one really big mistake is jumping to. We think about solutions. But so two parts to this. One is we don't matter. <laughs> like our opinion doesn't matter. So like me having this, and I learned this with failure with my first business. My grand idea doesn't mean shit if people don't want it. It's not a use, if it's not solving a problem. Second thing is that we jump, you know, we worry about complexity of like, oh my God, how might we solve that? Like we don't have the tech expertise, da, da, da. Um, first, before understanding the problem. I think if we understand the problem, generally there are lots of ways to solve something. You, know, you don't need to build an AI tool. You don't need to be an expert. You could just build a simple you know, consultancy business or, or coaching business, whatever. Um, so I think by really just focusing on like, who is the person? Do they have a problem? Is it a big enough problem that they are willing to pay for it? Then, then that's the only thing that matters. And after that, you can worry about, okay, shit, like how do we, yeah. you know, how do we deliver on the promise we made to them? How do we actually build something that's going to solve the problem? Yeah. And I think this is also touching on like the bigger part as well as that you have to be emotionally disengaged, especially if this is your yeah. initiative, because it could be that you just have this really, and I've seen this as well. Yeah. Um, I've seen uh, like startups come in and do a sprint and um, they have been kind of so like gung ho on like what they feel is the right product market fit for like what they want to achieve. And you know, with the experience of like a sprint team, um, certainly like AJ and Smart that was, you know, kind of offering up alternative suggestions that would kind of hit the market in a kind of more ready capacity. You know, it's a journey. Like you have to just at some point, my point here is at some point you have to disengage from it and be really um, unemotionally kind of connect, connected to it because you will end up just building the wrong thing if you don't listen to your, your customers or your target audience and you just want to build the things that you want to build. Exactly. But like, you know, my other book, this actually ties in really nicely to my other book, Lean Startup. Okay. Know, yeah. This is another good one you should read. Um, because this is the, the book that teaches you that actually, um, you know, you must pivot. Like if something doesn't feel right and you're making something, it could just be that your initial idea is actually, it's got you to that point. Like I, I kind of, kind of believe in kind of like this kind of like, you know, everything happens for a reason. But it could just be that if you find that you're kind of at this junction where actually what your your vision of what it should have been or could have been or would have been is completely different from what the, the market expect, you have to pivot to then kind of think about, okay, where are those um, opportunities from those pain points? Yeah, and this is what the lean topic. start goes into, yeah. It's a big topic I cover in, in my book because it, um, I mean, that requires the psychological sort of security and comfort with, with pivoting, right, detaching yourself from ideas. Um, but yeah, um, anyway, let's wrap it up because we've just hit six o'clock. Just final short question then. So we will, 
I'll post every link we've sort of mentioned here. So considering, Rob, final question, considering the current context of uncertainties with job losses, companies needing to change their business model, product value completely changing, if somebody could read one book, what would you recommend out of the ones we've mentioned? That's a good one. Um, I, I mean, actually, it would be interesting to know who you are and kind of like what your area of expertise is because um, there's um, a book that I have. Um, it's literally just something I have on my bedside table. And it's something that actually, what's really, it's, it's like my personal MBA. And um, basically, the first part of the book goes into um, basically saying, you don't need to read this book from cover to cover now. It's, yeah. it's such a good book that you can um, basically just pick it up as and when you need it. It has a really good index, and it gives you every kind of um, uh, understanding of like running a, a sm running a business, uh, being like in product design, literally everything. It's, it, it gives you everything that you need to know um, at your convenience. Um, so that would probably be one that I would recommend because it kind of shocked me the most. Um, yeah. Certainly, with regards to kind of like the, the the landscape that the world is in at the moment, I think it's still really good because I think, you know, you can interpret this in many different ways, and you could even interpret it as do you know what, like I maybe I now have more time than I had before. Certainly, working from home, um, you know, if you're still privileged to not have hours cut or you still have a job, um, yeah. you should still have more time in a day. Um, because you're not commuting. So pick up a book like that because it will give you kind of like this bonus that you wouldn't have had normally before. And um, the other book I would still recommend, uh, I don't know whether it's completely relevant for now, but it's uh, actually blitz scaling. Uh, and I think it's just really fascinating to kind of see how other companies have reacted um, during um, like the last 20 years of like how they've kind of made their success. And they've also had to pivot and grow as well. Because I've noticed that one, one point is, um, you know, when as companies are scaling, like they're dealing with new challenges and new uncertainties. So yeah. it's not different to what we're in. You know, maybe now is extreme, but, but once we come out of quarantine and move into sort of recession economy. Yeah. I think my side I've got messy middle for anyone that is managing, managing teams. I think this teaches you the soft skills. It's by Scott Belsky, who is head of design and head of product at Adobe now. We've got soft skills behind leadership and sort of navigating uncertainty, etc. I think that right now, if you're in a team that needs to pivot and innovate, hacking, sorry, growth hacking, I was kind of, no, it's hacking growth, yeah, by Sean Ellis is the book that I would recommend. Yeah. I think everything else comes after that. I think if you want quick action, then that provides you with a framework, you know, without needing to, to run a sprint, for example, a framework to very quickly start validating ideas that, that are delivering value to the business. Cool. I, I, I have one more book I can recommend, and it is completely relevant for what is happening now. And actually, I was recommended um, uh, this book by my old CrossFit instructor, um, um, Richard. So I could give him a little plug there. Um, so, But basically, the book he's recommended is called Anti-Fragile, and I've ordered this. I'm literally waiting for it to arrive on Amazon. Such a good book. Have you read it? Uh, oh my god! It's, uh, it is heavy go, but it's it's pretty life. I mean, so I'm trying to really <laughs> this super thesis. Yeah, I would highly recommend it. Yeah, the strap the strap line is things that gain from disorder. Yeah, so it's I would say to, to it draws in on a lot of philosophy, but broadly, yeah, rather than. Um, you know, how do you grow in uncertainty? How, you, how do you thrive in, in periods of uncertainty? It's a big book, though. It's a really hefty book. <laughs> I think we've got time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, let's, let's wrap it up because we've taken an hour and five minutes of everyone's time. So um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, hopefully that was useful. And we're going to send out a link tomorrow for the replay of this Um you know, we'd appreciate if you pass that on to anyone in your network that this may be useful for. We'll also post in that link to the book. I'll add a couple of articles that I think are going to be useful. Um, and then only ask, well, not really an ask for us. From my side, um, sorry, just going back to Frank, your question. I'm posting my Calendly link right now. And 
if you would like, just book a time and I'll, I'll cover your specific question about the positioning of your schizophrenia prototype. And um, yeah, more than happy to help. And we can sort of frame how you pitch that to people and, and set a metric for success for that. My other, only other ask or give, I suppose, is next Tuesday, 5 p.m., same time, um, we will be running a lightning decision jam to sort of show you the framework for moving from problem to solution within one hour. So feel free to join that. Um, I've got your email, so I will be emailing you about that tomorrow and then again on Friday, probably. Yeah, uh, yeah that's it, really. No specific ask from our side. Rob, anything to add before we... No, uh, just uh, how enjoyable this was. And, um, yeah, happy um, should the demand need it, kind of do this again. I think it has been really great. And, Henry, like, thanks for organising it, dude. It's been yeah, really, really okay. good. Oh, it took me five minutes to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> A few technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> if you this useful, please comment and we will then have a strong think about um, running one of these again. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Cool. Cheers, guys. Thanks Stay so well, everybody. Uh, we'll, well, we'll speak on Friday, won't we? Yeah, we will. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye.